First up is going to be Greta Christina. She is a regular atheist correspondent for Alternet. She also has a blog named after herself. Anybody read that? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. And uh, take it away. Hi. Um, wow, this just tickles me pink to be here. I can't even tell you. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and in particular, thank you for being here at 10.30 on a Saturday morning. I mean, traditionally, this is a time when uh, people are either having sex or recovering from having sex the night before and sleeping in like sensible people. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming out here to listen to me talk about sex. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to get right to it since we have time issues. Uh, I am here today to talk about atheism and sexuality. Uh, unsurprisingly to anyone who understands how evolution works, sex is one of the most important and most powerful elements of the human experience. And religion has gotten to frame the conversation about sex, pretty much like it's gotten to frame the conversation about everything, uh, for thousands of years. And if we're going to work towards a world in which atheism is both more common and more accepted, we need to offer some secular ways of dealing with sex. So today, I want to talk about some of the ways that we can be sexual without a religious framework. And uh, I'm going to break that up into two parts. Uh, I'm going to talk about how atheists can view sexual morality without a belief in God. And I'm going to talk about how we can view sexual transcendence without a belief in the supernatural. Uh, but before I talk about atheism and sexuality, I want to talk a little bit about religion and sexuality uh, to talk about what exactly we're up against and what we need to offer an alternative to. Uh, so the first religious view of sex that I'm going to talk about today is the view of most traditional religions, and it's by far the most common. And that view is, God cares who you have sex with and how. <laughs> God only wants you to have sex with certain people, typically a person of the opposite sex to whom you're legally married, although not always. Some religions permit same-sex marriage, and some religions ban sex altogether. Uh, not surprisingly, those religions don't do so well. Um, uh, important point, if you're going to start a religion and you want it to last more than a generation, do not make procreation a sin. Um, so God only wants you to have sex with certain people, and God only wants you to have certain kinds of sex with those people. Even within religiously sanctioned marriage, religious restrictions against the kinds of sex you can have include uh, restrictions against oral sex, anal sex, sex using birth control, ejaculating outside the vagina, sex with a woman who's menstruating, the use of pornography and erotica, cross-dressing, uh, even non-sexual activities such as dancing are prohibited by many religions because it could potentially lead to sex. Um, now, if these restrictions were based on fundamental human ethics or even on practical considerations, you'd expect them to be at least somewhat similar across every religion. But that's not what we find. There are a few common themes. Again, sex that's likely to result in procreation with a partner of the opposite sex to whom you're legally married is usually on God's yes list. Um, but throughout history and across different cultures, when we look at religious taboos on sex, we actually see a ridiculously wide range. For instance, some religions are OK with the standard variations, such as oral or anal sex, as long as it stays within marriage. Uh, others believe that God frowns on any sort of sex other than what the sex educators refer to as PIV, or penis and vagina intercourse. Um, and still others say that certain of the standard variations are OK, but others are really off, the, off limits. And famously, different religions have different beliefs about how these rules should be applied to men versus women. The sexual double standard is depressingly common across many religions, most religions even. Uh, but the details of how this double standard gets applied vary wildly. Is the punishment for adultery the same for women and men? Uh, are the rules about interfaith marriage the same for women and men? Uh, are the rules for divorce the same for women and men? Is monogamy required for both women and men? Or are men permitted and even encouraged to have multiple spouses? Uh, different religions answer all these questions very differently. And even the question of who it's OK to marry and who it's OK to have this permissible sex with varies from religion to religion. Uh, different religions have different rules about how old you have to be to get married, uh, how closely you can be related, uh, whether you can have been married before, uh, whether you have to be of the same religion or not, even how many people you can marry. And what's more, some religious restrictions on sex 
only address sexual behavior, while other religions cover not only forbidden sexual behavior, but forbidden thoughts and desires. The idea here is that God isn't just angered when you have prohibited sex, God is angered when you even think about prohibited sex. Uh, consider the loving and compassionate teacher teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, that <laughs> lusting in your heart is every bit as sinful as committing actual physical adultery. It's basically creating a thought crime. I mean, I have a hard time thinking of that teaching as anything other than a thought crime. And this kind of religious thought crime has the ugly effect of making people feel guilty and dirty for something they can't help, for desires that have been deeply and irrefutably wired into our unconscious by millions of years of evolution. Um, have any of you read the writings of the Christmas Underwear Bomber? Uh, you remember the Christmas Underwear Bomber, the uh, Muslim extremist terrorist, he strapped the explosives into his underwear to try to blow up a plane. Um, you should read his writings if you, if you can. They're really fascinating. This guy was tortured with religious guilt over sexual feelings that he believed were sinful. Some forbidden sexual acts as well also made him feel very guilty, such as not lowering his gaze in the presence of women, um, but also just simple sexual desires. And we're not talking about sexual desires that were in any way unethical or even that were particularly unusual. As far as this guy, we know this guy was not into spanking, he wasn't into jello, he wasn't into humping women on the subway. I, the guy was not even gay. Um, the mere fact that he found women sexually desirable and was aroused by looking at them this was enough to torment him with religious guilt and the terrible fear that he was disappointing his angry and vengeful God. It, it's like making people feel guilty about getting hungry or needing to sleep. And this is not a necessary part of religious sexual morality. This is not something all religions do, only some of the really special ones. <laughs> and often, the sexual ethics of a religion aren't just inconsistent with the sexual ethics of other religions. They're internally inconsistent. They're inconsistent with themselves. Um, take the moral lessons conveyed by so many uh, conservative Christian teachings. Sex is dirty and bad, and you should save it for the person you love. <laughs> Sex is so dangerous that even talking about it can send the desire for it spinning out of control. It's wicked, it's disgusting, you shouldn't even think about it until your wedding night. Which, if you kept your virginity, will be a glorious pinnacle of intimacy and sacred delight. <laughs> now, this teaching doesn't just conflict with the teachings of different religions. It, it also it doesn't even just conflict with the basic realities of human sexuality, including the reality that first times really often aren't that great. Um, it conflicts with itself. So clearly, we are not looking at a straightforward, unambiguous moral message from God. And we're not even looking at a solid set of clearly thought out moral positions based on sound and consistent, eth consistent ethical principles. What we're looking at is an almost random set of taboos. Taboos that make no more sense than the taboos we have about food or drugs. Uh, many anthropologists, uh, the one that I remember from when I was in school was Mary Douglas, uh, have argued that the point of taboos is to give people the feeling of control over powerful and important areas of our lives, such as food and drugs and sex. And that the human need for taboos is psychologically more important than the specifics of what those taboos are or whether they're rational or practical. And that is exactly what religious restrictions on sexuality look like. They're only peripherally about, or occasionally, about ethical matters such as who's harmed or what's fair, or even about practical matters like ensuring reproduction or maintaining the purity of the genetic line. They're about making people feel like they have control over sex by creating an arbitrary line between good sex and bad sex and convincing themselves that that line was drawn by God. Now, granted, there are some more progressive and moderate versions of these traditional religions, Reform Judaism, Progressive Christianity, etc., who believe that God doesn't really much care who you're having sex with and how, uh, as long as what you're doing is loving and consensual and everybody involved is happy. Uh, and these aren't the most common versions of these religions, but they're not the most unheard of either. 
And for these more progressive believers, on a day-to-day -day practical sense, their sexual ethics are a lot more like those of atheists and non-believers. They're not based on what makes God happy or unhappy. They're based on what makes people happy or unhappy. Uh, but even these more progressive Christians, Jews, Muslims, etc., still believe that morality comes from God. They still believe that our moral compass was instilled in us by God, including our moral compass about sex. And obviously, atheists don't believe that, and we're not going to live our lives according to it. So what is the atheist alternative to all of this? If we don't believe that God is peeking into our bedroom and taking notes, if we don't even think there is a God, much less one who cares who and how we're boffing, then what do we base our sexual morality on? Without a belief in God, are we really just looking at a sybaritic sexual free-for-all unrestrained by any ethical considerations? Uh, well, I, this answer may be a little disappointing to some of you, but I think the answer is pretty clearly no. Um, without belief in God, of course, we still have sexual ethics. But without belief in God, we're free to base our sexual ethics on ethics. We don't have to base our sexual ethics on what somebody else wrote down thousands of years ago about what God supposedly told them about how he does and doesn't want us to do the nasty. Human beings seem to have some core ethical values hardwired into our brains from millions of years of evolution as a social species. And then we hammer out the specifics and the finer points of those core values based on the standards that our particular society teaches us and on our own experiences and observations about what hurts and helps people and what's fair and unfair and what keeps society running more or less smoothly. And that's what we can base our sexual ethics on. We don't have to worry about questions like, does God think anal sex is gross? Instead, we can focus on questions like consent, honesty, fairness, harm. Let's look at a few examples. Uh, let's start with a no-brainer, or what I profoundly hope is a no-brainer, what I assume is a no-brainer. Uh, let's look at the question, is homosexuality moral? And instead of answering by saying homosexuality is immoral because gay sex makes baby Jesus cry, uh, <laughs> instead we can ask questions like, is anyone harmed by homosexuality? Is homosexuality consensual? Do homosexual relationships harm society in any way? Um, is it fair or just to have different rules for same-sex relationships than for opposite-sex ones? Uh, so let's look at another example, one with a somewhat less obvious set of answers. Uh, let's look at a question like, is pornography moral? And instead of saying our God prohibits us from viewing sexually explicit material, we can ask questions like, is there any good evidence that pornography affects people's sexual behavior in a negative way? And is there any good evidence that pornography contributes to sexism and misogyny any more than any other form of popular culture, such as TV and movies and pop music? Um, and can we acknowledge the right to the freedom of sexual expression while still critiquing the particular ways that porn commonly plays out in our culture? Uh, and one more example before I move on. We can look at a question like, what kinds of sexual limits should there be within a relationship or a marriage? And instead of saying God thinks oral sex is gross or whatever, we can ask questions like, is this consensual? Uh, do both partners or all partners, depending on your arrangement, want to do this? And is this sex act relatively safe or is it likely to cause harm? And is everyone involved being honest about their desires and limits and uh, accepting the possible consequences of these particular sexual acts? And if partners disagree about a particular sexual act, how do they resolve those differences? So when we're asking these questions and answering them, I think there's a couple of basic principles that atheists can base our moral decisions on. One is that we have to allow our sexual morality to be nuanced. When we let go of religious taboos on particular sexual acts or arrangements, we have to start viewing sexual ethics more on a case-by-case -case basis. And while some sexual acts can clearly be defined as ethical or unethical by anyone who's not a sociopath, you know, rape or child molestation being the obvious examples, a lot of sexual acts and arrangements fall into a more gray area where different values come into conflict. Uh, so let me give an example of this. Uh, let's look at a monogamous marriage where one spouse has decided they don't want to have sex anymore 
at all ever again. Not as a temporary thing, I'm depressed, I just had a baby, they're done. That person is not willing to negotiate, they're not willing to go to couples counseling, and they're not willing to consider non-monogamy. As far as they're concerned, the fact that they're done with sex for the rest of their life means their partner is done with sex for the rest of their life too. Is this morally wrong? And would it be morally wrong for the deprived partner to seek sex outside the relationship? Uh, and by the way, this is unfortunately not a made up hypothetical situation. And if you're thinking, oh, that she's just making up these hypothetical straw men, you know, to prove a point. No, this, if you read the sex advice col columns, you'll know that this is a depressingly common situation. So we have two conflicting moral values here. On the one hand, do people have the right to say no to sex? Well, of course they do. Absolutely they do. You know, we own our own bodies. And we have the right absolutely to say no to any particular sex act, to say no to all sex, for whatever duration that is, even if that includes the rest of our lives. We, our bodies belong to us. But do people have the right to non-consensually eradicate other people's sex lives? I don't think so. In fact, I would argue that the answer to that question is almost as clearly no as it is that the answer to the first question is yes. Now, you might argue that the other partner, the one who's being denied sex, can always leave the marriage. But what if that's a morally problematic choice? The, what if the couple has children or a business together and divorce would impact people other than just the two of them? Uh, what if one spouse is financially dependent on the other, for instance, for health insurance? So my point in raising this is not to settle this particular question. I, I do have my own opinions about it, but I think it's a very thorny ethical question and that is, in fact, exactly my point in raising it. Um, my point is that when we move away from strict religious taboos and rules about specific sexual acts and arrangements, such as adultery is always wrong, or people are always obligated to have sex with their spouses, both of which are rules that exist in particular religions, when we move away from those specific taboos on specific acts and arrangements, we have to accept there's going to be sexual situations that raise complicated ethical questions, questions that aren't always easy to answer and that good and honorable people are going to disagree about. And as atheists, we have to be willing to make difficult moral decisions, and we have to accept the responsibility for our choices without pawning them off on God. So that's one key ingredient of an atheist sexual morality, accepting the reality of moral nuance and acknowledging that sexual choices can be difficult without one clear answer, and accepting responsibility for our own difficult sexual choices. Related to that is the idea that we have to not make our sexual decisions by default. Far too many people take major serious steps in their sexual lives based on some sort of external timetable without thinking carefully about whether this is really the right time for them to take that step or even whether they want to take that step at all. Far too many people decide when in a relationship to stop seeing other people, when to start having sex, when to move in together, when to get married, when to have kids, etc. Not because it's what's right for them, without even really thinking about what's right for them, but because that's what's next, you know, it's time, you know, we got to get going, that's what's done, that's what people do. And lots of people think of these sexual steps and decisions in terms of when to do them without really seriously thinking about whether to do them at all. We have choices about whether to move in together, whether to stop seeing other people, whether to get married, whether to even get into a serious relationship at all. And making these decisions by default without careful consideration about whether it's right for you, it's not fair to yourself and it's definitely not fair to your partner. Uh, letting your major sexual decisions be made by social consensus it is a recipe for free-floating resentment. It's not responsible, and taking responsibility for our sexual choices is one of the most important parts of an atheist sexual morality. Another important part of an atheist sexual morality is that we have to be reality-based. Atheists sometimes like to let us, we like to call ourselves the reality-based community. If we're going to live up to that, we have to apply it to sex as well. We don't get to just say same-sex marriage will destroy the family. We have to look at the evidence about same-sex families, how their kids turn out, what effect they have on their communities, etc. We don't get to just say porn desensitizes people and teaches them to treat their sex partners like objects. We have to look at the evidence 
about how porn affects the people who, who use it and whether occasional porn consumption affects people differently from frequent porn consumption, et cetera. When we're evaluating the ethics of a particular sexual act or arrangement, we have to practice good evidence-based practices. And that includes being willing to change our minds. I was once in a debate with an atheist about uh, polyamory. This is this online debate. Uh, polyamory, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, it means a consensual, mutually agreed upon situation where people have sexual and or romantic relationships with more than one person at a time. Uh, some people don't like the word. It mixes Greek and Latin roots. Um, it's, <laughs> other words meaning more or less the same thing are open relationships or multiple relationships or non-monogamy. Although somebody pointed out to me when I gave this talk before, non-monogamy also mixes Greek and Latin roots, so you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so, so anyway, I was on a debate uh, in the Daylight Atheism blog uh, with an atheist who was insisting that polyamorous relationships were inherently unequal and selfish because of the inequity of what he called the standard polyamory setup. That's the harem type arrangement. One person with multiple partners and those partners don't engage with each other sexually. It's just one person, like, like a harem or standard old fashioned Mormon polygamy. So it was pointed out to him in this debate by people who are polyamorous or who are familiar with the polyamory world that there is no such thing as a standard polyamory setup. That this concept of a standard polyamory setup was one that he had pulled entirely out of his own ass that, in fact, virtually every polyamorous, non-monogamous, open relationship, whatever you want to call it, has a different arrangement tailored to meet the needs of the people who are involved in it. But this person making this argument refused to change his position and very stubbornly continued to defend it. That is not good humanist sexual ethics. We need to be willing to change our minds when we're confronted with evidence that contradicts it. And the story points up another principle. When it comes to sex, we need to be willing to listen to the people who are actually having the kind of sex that we're considering. Uh, there are way too many people who are willing to make moral judgments about gays and lesbians, porn consumers, non-monogamists, consensual sadomasochists, transgendered people, asexual people, sex workers, sex work customers, etc., without ever talking to the people who actually have these sex acts, without even reading the writings of people who actually have these sex acts, that is not good humanist sexual morality. We need to not prioritize our own prejudices and preconceptions about a particular sex act or arrangement at the cost of ignoring the people who are actually engaging in it. Now, we don't necessarily have to agree with them, but we have to listen to them and we have to acknowledge that maybe they know more about the kind of sex they're having than we do. And related to this, we have to remember that media depictions of alternative sexualities tend to be inflammatory and sensationalist. And we have to not assume that we know everything there is to know about sadomasochism or cross-dressing or whatever because we read an article about it in the New York Times. All of which leads me to my final principle of an atheist and humanist approach to sexual morality. Okay, not my final one. I could gas on about this all day. Get a drink in my hand tonight. I will pin you in a corner and talk to you for hours about this topic. But my final one for today, uh, which is that we cannot make moral judgments about sexuality purely on the basis of what grosses us out. Yeah, thank you. Now, this is a surprisingly difficult principle for many people to grasp, even atheists. The idea that personal revulsion is a good barometer of moral revulsion is very common. It's very common for people to think, I personally am upset by the idea of homosexuality or polyamory or sadomasochism or whatever, and therefore these things are immoral and nobody should do them. Look at the arguments, for instance, that are most commonly made against homosexuality. God forbids it is absolutely at the top of the list, but a close second is anal sex is disgusting. And as a moral foundation, these two arguments make about as much sense, which is to say, none. It's a ridiculous argument against homosexuality anyway, since lots of gay people don't practice anal sex and a whole lot of straight people do. Uh, but, uh, but I digress. Um, here's a useful way of looking at this question.
I've found when I'm pondering some question of sexual ethics, it's often useful to make a non-sexual analogy. Uh, our feelings about sex tend to run very strong and not always be rational, uh, for reasons of cultural training and also probably for some deeply hardwired evolutionary reasons as well. So when we're pondering some question of sexual ethics, it often helps to take it out of a sexual context, so our mammalian hindbrain isn't doing the thinking for us. And when it comes to this question of whether personal revulsion should or should not translate into moral revulsion, I like to do what I call the broccoli test. I personally am revolted by broccoli. I mean, like really, seriously and profoundly nauseated. The thought of eating it makes me wretch. I can barely stand to be in the room when it's being cooked. But I don't think that people who do like broccoli are immoral. <laughs> I don't try to talk people out of eating broccoli. I don't try to get laws passed banning broccoli. I don't make broad moral generalizations about the kind of person who eats broccoli. I don't avoid friendships and relationships with people who eat broccoli. I'm married to somebody who eats broccoli. I know these mixed marriages, they're always a trial, but we got through the rough patches. And, um, <laughs> um, and I don't try to get people who do eat broccoli banned from teaching in the public schools because their moral turpitude clearly renders them unfit to be in the presence of children. So in the same way, there are kinds of sex that I find completely unappealing even actively unpleasant. Uh, an example, adult diaper play. This is a type of sexual fetish where adults like to dress up in baby clothes and wear diapers and like that. Totally turned off by it, not interested in even trying it. But so what? Who cares what I think about it? Nobody's making me do it. And if the people who are doing it are, are as long as they're consensual, as long as they're not being harmed, as long as they're happy and it brings them joy, then what possible business is it of mine? I don't want to do it myself, but I completely support and encourage people who do. Um, thank you. Um, it, it's very common for people to do dime store psychology about other people's sex lives. Uh, the sex workers have low self-esteem. The sexual masochists have guilt complexes. The homosexuals had domineering mothers and absent fathers. Uh, it's really not very useful. The, the reality is that we just don't understand sexuality that well. And the answers to what causes different sexualities, they're very rarely as simple as that old Freudian analysis of he saw a pair of ladies' shoes at an impressionable age and that's why he has a foot fetish. Um, trying to figure out what causes a particular sexual desire, it's like reading tea leaves in a hurricane. It, it, the causes of sexual desire are very complex. They're multifactorial, as the social scientists like to say. Uh, we don't understand the degree to which they're inborn or learned or both. And the causes can vary wildly from person to person. What causes one person to be a consensual state of masochist could be different than what causes somebody else to want to do that. So apart from really obviously and grossly immoral sex acts such as rape or child molestation, sexual desires and practices are really not a very good barometer of personal character. And we have to remember that when we're tempted to make moral or character judgments about people based on the kinds of sex that they like. Uh, whenever I'm tempted to make judgments about other people's sexuality because I'm personally grossed out by it, I always have to remember that there are plenty of people who are grossed out by my sexual desires and practices. The sexual practices that I know are consensual and harmless and make everybody involved happy. And that's true of every single person in this room. No matter what your sexual practices are, there is somebody in the world who thinks they're gross. There are gay men and lesbians who think heterosexual sex is disgusting. There are people who think that celibacy is weird and unnatural. And so if I want other people to respect my right to make my own sexual decisions that are consensual and fair and don't hurt anybody, I need to extend that same respect to other people. And I need to not treat their private sexual practices as a personal affront to me. Um, and, and this principle of separating aesthetic judgments about sexuality from moral ones doesn't just apply to how we treat strangers or even how we treat friends and family members. It applies to how we treat the people that we're sexually involved with. If we don't like porn, and our partner does, 
We don't get to just say, porn upsets me, therefore you're a bad person for enjoying it. Uh, if we want our relationship to be monogamous and our sexual partner doesn't, we don't get to just say non-monogamy freaks me out, therefore you're a bad person for wanting to do it. Uh, if we're not interested in bondage and our partner wants to try it, we don't get to just say bondage scares me, therefore you're a bad person for being curious about it. And the flip side of that is also true. If we are interested in bondage or non-monogamy or porn and our partner isn't, uh, we don't get to accuse them of being unadventurous and uptight. We have to accept that our partner's views are as valid as ours. And we have to work out a compromise that works for both of us. We need to base our decisions on principles of consent, honesty, fairness, harm, not on the principle of what grosses us out. Okay. So these are some ideas of atheist sexual ethics, some ideas of how we can view sexual morality without believing in a God who's telling us who to boink and how. And these ideas aren't coming out of nowhere. I would love to let you think that I made all this stuff up totally, because I'm brilliant. Uh, and I am brilliant, but I did not make these ideas up. Uh, for, for many decades now, there's been a sex positive community of writers, activists, educators, researchers, therapists, artists, and just ordinary people in their everyday lives who have been advocating for a non-taboo based uh, approach to sex. And this is a community that, like the atheist movement, has been growing in visibility and numbers and influence. And this sex positive community has been loudly and passionately opposed to the conventional religious view of sex, this view that God really cares about who we have sex with and how, and that we should base our sex lives on his arbitrary rules. And yet, while the sex positive community has vehemently rejected these conventional religious views of sex, to a great extent it's done this not by rejecting religion altogether, but by embracing alternative religion and by bringing their positive view of sexuality into their spiritual beliefs. Uh, the sex positive community is very often a very spiritual community and many varieties of Wicca, goddess worship, shamanism, tantra, astrology, ki, chakras, belief in a collective metaphysical and consciousness and other forms of new age belief permeate it, both privately and publicly. And these spiritual beliefs are often not separate from the sexual culture. They're very intimately woven into it. Uh, which leads me to the second part of my talk. Uh, we've talked about how atheists can frame sexual ethics without religion. But how can we frame sexual transcendence without religion? How can we acknowledge and celebrate the power of sex to, to transform consciousness, to, to take us out of time, to transport us out of ordinary physical experience, to give us a feeling of connection with our partner that feels almost telepathic, and still view it as an entirely physical, entirely material, entirely non-supernatural experience. How can we view sex without religion? And not just sex without the capricious, vengeful, petty god who's obsessed with the details of people's sex lives at the expense of actual serious ethical issues, but sex without key energy and the immortal unconsciousness of the universe and honoring the goddess with our pleasure and so on. Um, the materialist view of life in general, and sex in particular, is often viewed as cold, bleak, narrow, mechanical, reductionist, generally a downer. I'm sure you've all heard all of those. How can we offer an entirely atheistic, entirely materialist, sex positive philosophy that is warm, rich, meaningful, intimate, and joyful. Well, I'm not going to offer dogma here, and I think ultimately we all need to find the answer to that question for ourselves, uh, but I was invited here to answer this question, <laughs> so I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, the materialist view says that there is no supernatural world at all. There is only the physical world. And all those things that seem non-physical thoughts, feelings, choices, selfhood, transcendent sexual ecstasy, consciousness in general, they're actually products of the brain and of the brain's interactions with the body and with the rest of the world. We don't yet know exactly how this works. The science of neuropsychology is still very much in its infancy, but the overwhelming evidence we have so far is that this seems to be so. And to me, this is not a downer. This is magnificent. To me, the idea that out of nothing but earth and water and sunlight, 
these wildly complex living beings have developed, not only with the capacity for consciousness and self-awareness, but with the capacity to create the experience of ecstasy for ourselves and one another. That is just jaw-droppingly astonishing. We can create the experience of joy, of deep, expansive pleasure that takes us out of ourselves and into one another. And we do it through a complex rearrangements of the energy of the sun and of the atoms and molecules of the planet. That is magnificent. That, more than any spiritual belief I ever held, makes me feel both intensely humble and intensely proud. That makes me feel intimately connected with the universe in a way that no spiritual practice ever did. What's that old hippie song about how we're stardust made of billion-year-old carbon? You don't have to believe in metaphysical energy to think that that is wicked cool. There's something else, too. When you look at human beings from a materialist and evolutionary standpoint, not as special spiritual entities or children of the goddess, but just as another twig on the evolutionary tree, that view puts sex squarely front and center in the human experience. Sex has an immensely important place in the evolutionary scheme. Darwin wrote an entire book about it. Why does sex feel good? Sex feels good because sex evolved to feel good. Sex feels profoundly, transcendently amazing because evolutionary forces strongly favor animals who really, really like to boff. <laughs> now, that's obviously an oversimplification. Uh, for one thing, evolution can also favor animals who are picky about their sexual partners, and obviously not all evolution happens, uh, and not all reproduction happens through sex. But it is a huge part of the picture. Now, of course, Birth control and other non-reproductive, shall we say, non-reproductive sexual practices uh, have been shifting this picture somewhat for humans, uh, putting reproduction into our conscious control and increasingly setting it apart from sexual pleasure, not to mention non-sexual reproductive practices such as in vitro fertilization. And I'm totally fine with that. Without getting into too much inappropriate personal detail, uh, my own personal sex life is entirely non-reproductive. Uh, I am a lesbian identified bisexual who doesn't have kids and doesn't want them and is never going to have them. Uh, my DNA can go suck an egg. Uh, and, um, and, yeah, so, sorry guys, it's just how it is. Um, and I am entirely in favor of sex shifting away from its original evolutionary function. And in fact, I would point out that many of the most beautiful and valuable parts of human experience happen when we take basic evolutionary wiring and transform it into something far beyond any prosaic matters such as survival and reproduction. And we took our animal need for palatable food and we transformed it into chocolate souffle with salted caramel sauce. <laughs> we took our ability to make and use tools and we turned it into the Apollo moon landing. We, we took our uniquely precise ability to communicate through language and we turned it into King Lear. And the same is true for sex. We've taken our hardwired urge to replicate our DNA, again, sorry guys, um, and we have turned it into an intense and delightful form of communication, intimacy, creativity, community, personal expression, and love, regardless of whether any DNA gets replicated in the process. But it's undeniable that these evolutionary forces are where the roots of sexual pleasure lie, and they're roots that go back hundreds of millions of years. So in other words, according to a materialist viewpoint, the capacity for transcendent sexual joy is hardwired into our brains. And it's deeply and powerfully hardwired as a crucial and central feature of our lives by hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And this doesn't just mean that suppressing or trivializing sex is stupid and futile, dangerous and harmful, a cruel and pointless crusade against the deeply laid grain of our nature. Err. It does mean that, don't get me wrong. But it also means that the act of sex and the experience of sexual pleasure connects us to every other living thing on Earth. We are the cousins of everything that lives on this planet with a common ancestor of primordial soup going back hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. And we are all related, not entirely, but substantially, because of sex. That is awesome. 
That makes me want to stop the lecture, grab my wife, go off to our hotel room, and go have sex right now. <laughs> Just so that I can feel connected with my fish and tetrapod and primate ancestors. That is entirely made of win. <laughs> and finally, when you don't believe in God or the soul or any sort of afterlife, when you think that this short life is all that we have, then making the most of that short life and taking advantage of the joyful experiences it has to offer suddenly becomes a whole lot more important. It's almost a moral obligation. As Richard Dawkins has so eloquently pointed out, the odds against you personally having been born are beyond astronomical. Are you going to waste that life by not giving yourself and other people as much joy as you possibly can? Now, this doesn't mean, as many anti-atheists claim, that without a belief in God or an afterlife, we would behave entirely selfishly and with no moral compass. It, we covered that already in part one. It doesn't mean that even a little bit. But it does mean that we can base our morality, including our sexual morality, on how our behavior demonstrably affects people in this life and not on how it supposedly affects invisible beings in some hypothetical other world outside of this one that we're going to theoretically go to after we die but that nobody knows about. And that means that as long as we don't cause harm to people in this life, it is not only acceptable, but a positive and meaningful good to engage in any activities that bring joy and epiphany and meaning to ourselves and to one another including, and maybe even especially, sex. In other words, I don't think we need to say, see sex as spiritual in order to see it as transcendent. I don't think we need to see sex as blessed by the goddess or a telepathic connection between souls or a channeling of the key energy or any form of worship or spiritual practice in order to see it as valuable. I think we can see sex as a physical act between animals and still see it as richly, deeply valuable and meaningful. I think we can see sex as a physical act and still see it as an act that connects us intimately, not only with ourselves and with one another, but with all of life and with the expanse of history and with the vastness of the universe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.